Hello and welcome to the Institute of Economic Affairs vidcast with me, Sai Kamal. I am the Academic Research Director at the IA and I'm also a Professor of Politics and International Relations at St Mary's University in Twickenham. You can find more of our vidcasts, podcasts and other online content on our YouTube channel, IA London, on Podbean and also on our website, www.ia.org.uk. Now, during these podcasts and videocasts, what happens is that members of the IA team are joined by academics, commentators, authors and other experts to discuss the pertinent issues of the week and the latest research. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Matt Ridley. His books have sold over a million copies, been translated into 31 languages and won several awards. He writes a weekly column for The Times in London and writes regularly for The Wall Street Journal. As Viscount Ridley, he was elected to the House of Lords in February 2013. He served on the Science and Technology Select Committee, and Matt has also won the Hayek Prize in 2011, the Julian Simon Award in 2012, and the Free Enterprise Award from the Institute of Economic Affairs in 2014. Matt, thank you very much for joining me today. Now, you have a new book out. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Said, it's great to be with you today, and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and yeah, I do want to tell you about my new book. It's called How Innovation Works. And I've tackled the topic of innovation in some previous books uh, obliquely, but this time I take it straight on and say, look, what is this mysterious process that is responsible for our prosperity more than any other factor uh, that happens to us uniquely as a species, and it doesn't happen to rabbits or rocks, um, and that flares up in some parts of the world more than others at certain times, the Italian city-states or California or uh, Song China or, you know, wh what is innovation and, and how do we encourage it and why do we uh, sometimes discourage it and, and these kind of questions. So um, uh, the, the, the book actually came out of uh, the IEA in a sense because you guys kindly invited me to give a Hayek lecture uh, in 2018. And um, in fact, I think you wrote the foreword to it, Said. So um, I'm very grateful to that, to the publication of the lecture. And as I was writing this lecture, set, saying, I just want to pull out that the four or five, well, no, I think the 10 or 12 features of innovation, you know, what is it, what, what is characteristic of innovation? Um, that, that is it gradual or sudden? Is it uh, something that happens because of individual geniuses or a collective uh, sort of collaboration, uh, all these kind of questions. And then I thought each of these would make actually a um, chapter in a book, but then I changed tack and decided, no, that that lecture could turn into one chapter and the rest of the book would be filled with examples of innovation, partly because people like reading stories and partly because the more stories I could tell about great innovations that change the world the more, the more I could sort of uh, persuade the reader that, that there are general lessons to be learned that keep coming around again and again in, in similar stories. So I, I tell the story of the steam engine. I tell the story of the search engine. I tell the story of vaccines. I tell the story of vaping. You know, so big stuff, little stuff, biological stuff, physical stuff. Um, in every case, it's nice to tell the tale of someone's life and how it interacted with the things that they helped invent and innovate. Um, and basically the sorts of um, lessons I draw from this uh, are that innovation is much more gradual than we think, much more incremental. It's not a sudden process. You don't get the, the, the disruptive breakthroughs nearly as often as you think. Uh, it's serendipitous. That is to say, quite often the uh, innovator comes from uh, an unexpected direction. Um, it's recombinant. That is to say, what we tend to do is combine different technologies to produce new technologies rather than invent things from scratch. Um, innovation is very different from invention. Uh, innovation is uh, the, the process of turning an invention or an idea into something that's practical, affordable, and uh, available to everybody. Innovation depends hugely on trial and error. This comes out again and again if you listen to the great innovators. It's a team sport. That is to say, uh, it's never true that there's a, you know, a genius who does everything. It, he always relies on his predecessors and his successors to turn something into a good idea, uh, and he has to collaborate. The people who try and do things on their own don't do nearly as well. It's a sort of inexorable process. It, it, once it gets started, there's a sort of inevitability about it, about, about it uh, 
uh, proceeding. It's the seed of science just as often as it's the fruit of science. It creates jobs rather than destroys them. It reduces our need for resources because it, it's always looking for frugality um, if done well. And above all, and this is the sort of main thesis of the book, what do we need to do to encourage it? Well, it flourishes in freedom. Again and again and again, this lesson emerged that uh, you had to have the freedom to experiment, to try anything, uh, the freedom to, to, to think differently, but the freedom to do differently as well. Um, that sort of is the secret source of innovation. So that's the book. Um, it was to be published uh, this week, um, but it's been delayed in the UK until the 25th of June to, write, to enable me to write a afterword, uh, a chapter about COVID-19, basically, and what that tells us. And just to uh, give the game away, what that tells us is that we need more innovation, not less. If we'd had more, we'd have been in a better position to cope with this pandemic. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I know we really should be promoting your book, but uh, um, you did refer to the uh, Hayek lecture, and we did publish that as a book called How Many Light Bulbs Does It Take to Change the World? Um, any viewers or listeners can find that on the IA website. And you also very kindly wrote a summary chapter for a past edition of Economic Affairs. And you can also find that on our website. Um, now, what's very interesting about your thesis, as it were, is that most people tend to think of the heroic inventor who kind of has that her uh, eureka moment, leaping from his or her bathtub with a world-changing idea. But you believe it's not quite that simple. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, the it, it turns out that... Uh, once you examine closely these claims by people that the the, the light bulb went on over their head, uh, they're nearly always um, reconstructed in retrospect uh, rather than happened at the time. Um, so uh, Archimedes, I, we, I can't tell you whether Archimedes jumped out of the bath and ran down the street or not because I wasn't there and, and nobody, nobody else was. That, that one might be true. Um, but uh, for example, uh, in the case of the guy who invented container shipping, who's called Malcolm McLean, uh, a very good example of a very persistent innovator who just drove this change through, bringing the cost of uh, international trade dramatically downwards by the, you know, the idea of standardized containers. Um, uh, the, the legend is that he was sitting waiting uh, to have his truck unloaded at a port and thinking, what a waste of time this is. And, you know, suddenly he, he had the idea and the rest is history. Well, he said that's bunk. That isn't the way it happened. And everyone else said it's bunk. And the, his biographer said, I keep telling people it's nonsense, but they don't want to hear it. They want to believe in the heroic um, uh, eureka moment. Um, uh, and the, the, you know, we single people out and we give them a prize or a patent. Um, uh, and that's a bit unfair on other people. And this is revealed by the fact that a bunch of people then come out of the woodwork and say, well, hang on, A, I contributed to him, or B, I actually invented it completely independently and I'm getting no credit. Uh, so, you know, the 23 different people invented the light bulb in the same decade, a point I, I made in that lecture. Actually, I think it's 21. The, the two of them were working together. Um, uh, so um, uh, it really is a myth, the heroic inventor. And if you set out to be an inventor who thinks you can do it all from scratch in your head without telling anyone, uh, you'll fall flat on your face. And that's exactly what happened to a guy called Samuel Langley, who thought he could invent, it, invent powered flight. He was a brilliant astronomer. He was head of the Smithsonian. He got a huge grant from the U.S. government. Uh, and he kept everything secret. He had a team of engineers working for him, but all the ideas were his, and he designed this enormous contraption, put it on the top of a houseboat on the Potomac, put a man with a life jacket uh, in, the, in the controls, and fired it up to a huge crowd watching, and it went up into the, to the air, um, fell over backwards, and fell 20 feet from the houseboat into the water. Um, Ten days later... Uh, two humble brothers from Ohio did achieve powered flight, the Wright brothers, um, a few hundred miles away. And nobody believed them at first because they weren't grand enough. Um, but also the way they'd done it was very much incremental and gradual and consulting people. They did a huge amount of correspondence with people. They picked other people's brains the whole time. They didn't try and do the whole thing inside their head. 
But you you say that, but we do still cling on to the idea of heroic inventors, don't we? I mean, think fictionally John Galt in Iron Man's uh, At the Shrugged, or maybe in the real world, people like Trevor Bayliss, who invented the wind-up radio, or James Dyson. Um, they do exist, don't they? Well, uh, it is absolutely true that you can be a great innovator. And uh, you notice I'm using the word in innovator, yeah. not inventor. I mean, you can be a great inventor too, but I, I think the, the really important people are the innovators. People like Thomas Edison or James Dyson, who don't pretend to have, uh, you know, actually sort of had your wholly original ideas. They're just very, very good at making original ideas practical and affordable and, and available. Um, uh, and uh, they they lead teams. Um, uh, Edison basically set up a factory, the product of which was innovations. Um, he showed it can be done. If you know, if you make innovation in your output, you will achieve something. Patents was what he was aiming at most of the time. Um, uh, and Dyson has, has a fantastic series of uh, innovations to his name that, that changed the world. Um, so yeah, the individuals can be incredibly important, but as as um, conductors of an orchestra, not as soloists, I think is probably the way of, of putting it. Um, you say you talk about Edison, and you say, of course, everyone attributes uh, the invention of the light bulb to Edison. And your book, as you say, you know, twenty-one or twenty-three other people invent at the same time. Was he just better at marketing, as, as it were? And I, I mean, another example when you think of uh, Edison was, you know, as he himself admitted that he did have a lot of failures. It was very much trial and error. And that's what innovation is about. For example. He wanted a sort of uh, electricity distribution to be via direct current, whereas actually mm -hmm. it was Nikola Tesla's uh, uh, invention of alternating current that won out when it comes to electricity distribution. But people don't really remember Nikola Tesla unless you study physics or engineering. Is it because Edison was just a better marketing man as well, or is there more to it? I think there's more to it than marketing, because there's no doubt if you take the light bulb for, for, for first, um, there's no doubt that light bulb that Edison's light bulb was better than everyone else's. Um, uh, I mean, there was Swan in England and Lodigan in Russia, and so on, and they they all produced perfectly good working prototypes, and so does Edison. But the point was, how do you make a light bulb persist? How do you make a light bulb last? You know, there's no point in a light bulb that can do a demonstration for a few hours and then go pop. Um, the question was, how do you get one that, that will get hundreds or thousands of hours out of it, um, out of its use? Uh, and this was the problem that Edison set out to crack. Uh, and he worked his way through 5,000 different types of plant material uh, until he found a kind of Japanese bamboo that made the perfect filament that uh, just lasted longer than every other filament and worked really well as an illuminant. Um, so uh, that's a very good example of what he was good at, as you say, trial and error. And he famously said, uh, it's not that I've failed, I've just found 5,000 different ways that don't work, which is a lovely quote, I think. And he's also, of course, the man who said, uh, invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yes. And that, for me, encapsulates the difference between invention and innovation. I mean, he used the word invention, but I think he's basically talking about innovation here, that it's the perspiration. And so it, th this means that the people who had the original ideas often feel short-changed. They say, well, how come... You know, somebody else is making all the money out of my idea. Um, but actually, they're forgetting that most it, it's not an easy problem turning an idea into something really practical that works. This is very nicely brought out by a story that Charles Towns, the inventor of the laser, used to tell. Um, a rabbit and a beaver are looking at the Hoover Dam. And the beaver's saying to the rabbit, um, no, I didn't build it, but it's based on an idea of mine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, interesting you say about Edison probably invented the best light bulb, but does the best technology always win out? I mean, if I think about the you know, 20 or 30 years ago uh, video recorders, um, and people often thought that Betamax or even the Philips 2000 uh, format was actually a much better uh, standard than the VHS, but it was VHS that won out in the end. What is it when added to innovation and technology that makes one technology win out over another? Well, I, you're right that that is the classic example of a, of a, of a second-rate technology beating a first-rate one that we've all heard of. The fact that we've all heard of it slightly implies to me that it doesn't happen that often, that, that usually the best technology will out. Um, uh, you know, usually uh, Tesla wins and Edison loses, even though Edison's the bigger name, if you like. Um, 
because the, his technology genuinely is better. Um, but sure, it is possible if you've got the marketing might uh, to insist on all of us using a second-rate technology. The example I'm, I want to give, actually, of this is where governments insisted on us using a second-rate technology, and it's quite recent. Uh, and that is the compact fluorescent light bulb, which was basically invented by Philips and co. And they lobbied hard, saying, look, this thing uses less energy. So you really should tell people to use it. And the government should have said, well, if you want to tell people to use it, fine, go ahead and market it. And they said, well, it's, it's too expensive to buy. Although it uses less energy, it's very expensive to buy. So people are not buying it. And um, so government said, um, uh, all around the world, government said, right, from now on, we're going to forbid the selling of incandescent light bulbs so that you all have to buy compact fluorescent light bulbs um, to fatten Philips's bottom line, uh, but also to um, uh, save energy and save the, the climate. Well, it turned out these things were deeply unpopular. They, they, they were slow to warm up, if you remember. Uh, they uh, gave a slightly uh, deathly light. Um, they were very difficult to dispose of. They had toxic chemicals in them. They didn't last as long as advertised. Um, it was actually a terrible um, mistake to force us all to use these. But above all, the reason it was a mistake was because waiting in the wings was a better technology than either of them, called the LED, the light emitting diode, which used far less um, electricity, um, produced far less heat, uh, was uh, extraordinarily flexible. You could produce any kind of light color with it. It was a relatively recent invention. And by insisting on compact fluorescent bulbs, Government almost certainly delayed the progress of LEDs. Well, now, I don't know about you, but I'm replacing everything I can with an LED and getting rid of, certainly getting rid of complex fluorescent bulbs, but, uh, but even getting rid of incandescents. So the complex fluorescent phase was a big mistake that was forced upon us, um, uh, and the LEDs is the right way to go. It's interesting that you bring up the role of government, because this is where I wanted to go next. It's I often think about innovation and government kind of have an analogy with trade. So, for example, when you talk about trade um, between a willing buyer and a willing seller, government can either get out of the way or get in the way, and often does get in the way. Now, some people believe it applies to innovation too. You've talked about an example of rent seeking by a, a particular manufacturer. Um, others look at things like the precautionary principle being overly precautionary. Uh, how do you see the role of government in innovation and examples of it getting in the way and good examples of it getting out of the way? Well, uh, more often than not, uh, government is a problem because government gets lobbied um, on behalf of one technology against another um, or it uh, imposes regulations that simply stifle the development of innovation. So, for example, uh, regulation has basically killed nuclear power's ability to innovate because the licensing of a new design is simply too expensive and difficult and so nobody try it. You can't get trial and error going. Now, there's quite a good reason for that. We don't want error in nuclear designs, but it is nonetheless the case. Um, in Europe, we've turned our back on an entire um, technology, genetic modification of crops. Uh, and we've done that not by government banning uh, uh, but by government making it so difficult to get one approved that nobody even tries. So to the extent that government is involved in innovation, it is often a problem. Um, and when government champions a technology, it quite often picks a loser rather than a winner. Um, I've given an example in the case of the copper crescent bulb. But that said, one can't, of course, rule out the fact that government can help in innovation and often does. So it can help by setting a standard. That, and, and if you get the right standard, that can drive innovation uh, very effectively. A good example of that is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States, passed by under the Clinton administration in the 1990s, which effectively unleashed e-commerce on the world. It was, a, it was a piece of regulation that essentially set a standard for how uh, uh, websites and online operators would be treated, essentially said they were platforms, not publishers. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, it enabled a huge wave of uh, innovation to happen. It was permissive regulation. It was regulation that actually sort of encouraged uh, people to go down a, a certain route. Um, uh, now, you know, a lot of people say, well, hang on, a lot of the things in the iPhone or the internet were invented within government. You know, they came out of DARPA or they came out of GPS, came out of, uh, you know, uh, the Defense Department and so on. So, um, 
But actually, when you read the history of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, what really counts is is that it spun out people who went off and did things elsewhere that made a difference. Um, uh, and when the government is taking close to 40% of national income uh, and spending it uh, itself, it jolly well better spend some of that on innovation because otherwise it's starving the economy of 40% of potential spending on innovation. Um, so uh, it's it's not a surprise to find government involved in innovation, but I think it is a mistake to exaggerate its role. It's very good at picking losers. But Matt, it is the fact that, isn't it, that, you know, that um, private innovators can build on um, bodies of government research. Yes, you're you're right that uh, that you know government produces uh, government spending produces innovations that that can then be built on by um, private innovators, and there are lots of examples of that. But there's also examples of, of of the other way around. And in this respect, one of the things I argue in the book is that um, the linear model of starting with science and ending up with innovation is a mistake. It's not the way it happens uh, necessarily all the time. It can happen that way, but it quite often doesn't. So the, the, the way I put it is that, uh, uh, sure, science is sometimes the seed and innovation is the fruit, but just as often it's the other way around. Um, innovation is the fruit and science is the seed. I mean, it was the steam engine that led to the uh, uh, discovery of thermodynamics, etc., very good recent example of this, I think, is the uh, CRISPR genome editing technology that is a very exciting new development of the last few years, which enables uh, us to do very precise edits of the genomes of plants and animals and uh, indeed people in, in cases of curing cancer. Um, uh, where did this come from? Well, it comes out of university laboratories. It looks like a pure science thing. But when you look into it more closely, you then find that where did they get the idea of this technology? Um, well, they got it from the yogurt industry. <laughs> the yogurtist industry has a perpetual problem, which is that it depends on bacteria. These are the sort of domesticated creatures that it uses to turn milk into yogurt. And um, what these bacteria sometimes get ill. Uh, and when they get ill, it means they've caught a virus. And so they, the yogurt industry had scientists working on how to work out why some yogurt cultures get sick and some don't. And one of the things they spotted was some obscure research by a, 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 a Spanish researcher working with the salt industry in Algeciras um, uh, who had found these strange sequences in bacteria um, that had a very odd and repetitive structure. Um, and the yogurt guys worked out that this was actually the bacterial immune system designed to keep a library of viral sequences to attack the virus. And th it was later discovered that you could repurpose this to genome editing in all sorts of creatures. But the point is, where where do you you know is industry the source or the or the or the the sink? Uh, sorry, the source or the the output of this? It's actually both. Um, so it's a great mistake, I think. And actually, we've known this for 50 years. If you read the literature on this, people keep saying it's not linear. And yet, policymakers in particular seem to think that all innovation starts in universities and ends up in business. Uh, and I, I just think that's a mistake. It's interesting. In um, a recent podcast, you uh, point to a chapter in your book where you explain your optimism about our ability to defeat whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Now, we're speaking in the middle of lockdown, you know, induced by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Do you think that statement still stands? Well, yes, I do in the long run. Um, I think that uh, if, if this terrible pandemic does its worst, it will uh, do economic damage as well as uh, killing tragically large numbers of people but it is unlikely to set back the progress of human betterment. Uh, we are on average lifting 160,000 people out of extreme poverty every year. Um, that is a phenomenon that's been going on for, for 20, 30 years. Every day, 
sorry, did I say every year? I meant every day. Uh, you know, that's the rate at which people are being lifted out of extreme poverty by uh, innovation. You know, we're, there's now less than 8% of the world lives in extreme poverty. When I was born, it was two thirds. You know, these are extraordinary changes. And we are defeating malaria, the biggest infectious killer, at an extraordinary rate now. It was getting worse in the 1990s. It's now getting better so much that the mortality from malaria has halved since the year 2000. So against the backdrop of this virus, there are uh, some, I mean, in the, in the background of this virus, there are some other things going in the right direction. But more than that, my point is slightly that uh, we need innovation to beat this virus, just as we needed innovation to beat smallpox or cholera or whatever it was. In the case of cholera, it was sanitation. In the case of smallpox, it was vaccination. What will be the innovation that defeats COVID-19? Um, uh, well, it might be test, track, and trace. You know, It might be a software solution that gets us out of this. It might be the first really effective antiviral drugs. Actually, the Ebola epidemic gave us some really promising candidate antiviral drugs. And for the first time, we might have antivirals to, to rival the antibiotics we use against bacteria. Um, or it might be a vaccine. And there are so many new ways of developing vaccines. But what has slightly shocked me about this episode is how little innovation we have seen in some of these areas. Yes, we've seen improvements, as I've just mentioned, in antiviral drugs. But look at vaccination. Vaccine development is really slow still, and it's fairly primitive. And actually, it's been an orphan technology with very little money thrown at it. Why? Because we'd largely defeated infectious diseases. In very few people were dying of them in the West. Uh, and uh, because uh, a vaccine is not a profitable thing for a drug company to develop, because if it works, it does itself out of business in short order. Um, uh, so uh, on the whole, this has been neglected. And the one thing we've learned from this episode is that we should not be neglecting vaccine development. In 2017, the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation set up something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which was about speeding up vaccine development and making it uh, making a platform that was, would work in a more general way for any new uh, pandemic that came along. And that was a really good idea. But why only in 2017? And why the Gates Foundation and Wellcome? Why hadn't the World Health Organization set that up 20 years ago? Um, uh, so uh, very much this the story of this epidemic is that we need more innovation, not less, and we've been neglecting it. And one of my critiques here is that we've been focused on the wrong risks. Um, so uh, the World Health Organization put out a statement in 2015 saying the greatest threat to human health in the 21st century is climate change. Well, doesn't that suggest to you that the World Health Organization was looking the wrong way when this pandemic came along? Yes, and there's been quite a lot of criticism about the World Health Organization. I mean, not only uh, during this recent pandemic, uh, but over time, for, um, if anyone's uh, look, looked at this issue in detail, whether they focused on vertical uh, interventions or, or tried to look at too much uh, horizontal interventions, whether they have actually f focused on the right things, uh, as, as you rightly say. And that, that kind of brings us on to a point that we touched upon earlier, which is the role of government. Do, do you see a role for government in encouraging innovation, or is this one of the things where government should get out of the way and leave it to, I don't know, someone, some uh, multi-millionaires to come forward and offer prizes, for example? Where do you see government in, in this? Well, uh, I think government should pay a huge amount more attention to uh, reducing the obstacles to innovation. Um, it, at the moment, its, it's regulators often uh, turn out to be a, a big deterrent to innovation. Um, just to give you one example relevant to the COVID epidemic uh, at the moment, um, it, it takes on average 70 months in Europe to approve a new medical device. Now, that could be a, a diagnostic test for a virus, for example. If you had invented a fast point of care diagnostic test that could give you almost instant results um, using uh, polymerase chain reaction to on nucleic acids, um, you'd think that would be a good thing to have done. But if it takes 70 months to get licensing, to get approval for such a thing, think how many firms did not go into that area because they couldn't afford 
70 months of capital burning uh, from uh, for their investors. Um, so there are, it, it, to me, the big, big issue is the delays that government builds into any kind of innovation through their regulatory system. And that's what needs to be first attended to. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the other issue for me is intellectual property. I come down very firmly against intellectual property in this book. Um, the evidence is pretty strong that whether it's copyrights and uh, the music industry or whether it's patents and uh, various other industries, um, uh, they get in the way. They don't help. They don't encourage innovation. Just to take a good example, the 3D printing industry, some key patents have just expired in the last uh, five years. The result has been a collapse in the price of 3D printing and a vast increase in new ideas about how to do it. So the patent was slowing us down. And this was true of uh, James Watt's patents on the steam engine and many other case histories uh, that I examine. So um, I think we need to find better way. And, and notice government has been encouraging the strengthening of patent and copyright systems and big, through lobbying from business, of course, um, uh, so that, for example, this book, if it is successful, will be earning royalties for my grandchildren 70 years after my death. Who agreed to that? I mean, let them get a job. Why on earth should they live off my hard work? <laughs> <laughs> All people have been living longer. I remember. I, think people, I remember when they were extending the uh, copyright. Uh, I think it was Cliff Richard who was uh, in favour of it because he, he had he had outlived the copyright, hadn't he? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting when you talk about patents because before we had this idea of patents or uh, pat patenting was uh, as developed as it is now. Um, we still had we had innovation. Of course, we had innovation. That's you know that's why we, we're there now. And sometimes innovation was just because people discovered it and they liked the idea that they, they discovered an idea and they wanted to share it. But other times it was through prizes as well. Um, yes. If you if you were to advise government and you know, the prime minister said, you know, Matt, you've written about innovation. How should we be encouraging innovation? For for example, finding a a, a cure or a vaccine for COVID nineteen. What would your advice be? Well, I think Anton Howes has written very interestingly about this, and, and I, I thoroughly endorse his idea, um, which it was not his idea, but the idea that he's championing, which is the idea of prizes in the form of advanced market commitments. So if you say, look, you can have £20,000 if, um, uh, if you invent a, a way of measuring longitude, which is what the British government said in 1714, um, then eventually, yes, you'll get the result and you'll give uh, John Harrison as he, as he uh, who was the winner uh, 20,000 um, pounds but if instead you say as the Gates Foundation did anyone who can invent a vaccine for pneumococcus which is killing a lot of people in the developing world killing a lot of children and won't be profitable anyone who can invent such a thing will get a prize but the prize will not come in a lump sum it'll come in a guaranteed good price in other words we'll top up the price that uh, that you can charge for this vaccine and that worked incredibly well and has saved something like 700,000 lives there were three candidate vaccines came forward it's interesting you say that about prices because um one of my heroes is where is, is, was a chap called Bert Rattan um and Rattan was a, uh, the guy who um developed the sort of the first suborbital uh, space plane um which became known as uh, Spaceship One. And he won a prize. It was the Ansari X Prize. I think it was a million dollars. It may be more. Um, and what he did was he developed the first privately funded spacecraft to enter space. And he did that in pursuit of a prize and, you know, and made, made some incredible innovations along the way. So does it have to be like that? Could it not just be a, a cash prize? Well, in some cases, yes. But the problem with a cash prize for inventing a vaccine is that uh, there's then no incentive for the firm to go out and sell these vaccines or provide these vaccines to people who can't afford it. So, you know, it was quite the, the advanced market commitment enables you to, to set it up uh, in, in that way. But, you know, the advantage of a prize, let's remember, is that you don't get 17 years during which uh, the 
inventor can charge high prices and command a monopoly and prevent competitors developing better versions, which is what you get with a patent. Uh, you give the guy a, a pat on the back and a large check and tell him, thank you very much, off you go. Now anyone else can join in. So, for example, and, and by the way, uh, along with this, you could the government could actually buy out patents to encourage innovation. The French government did this with photography in, in the 1830s. They bought out Louis Daguerre's patent uh, and said, anyone can use this technology they like. We've, we've rewarded him. He's He's happy. Uh, he's gone off to live in his chateau or whatever we've done to him. Um, uh, so um, I think we need to think about that a lot more. I think buying out patents could be a, a good idea as, as a way of government in investing in innovation. Um, what I don't like is government choosing certain technologies and subsidizing them. And at the moment, we have an industrial policy that is very much obsessed with that. Uh, it came out of the May government, and it's uh, um, increasingly about picking winners. It says it's not. It says it's not going to pick winners, but I'm afraid it always does when it's uh, basically throwing subsidies at certain technologies. It's championing certain technologies, whether it be uh, AI or whatever. Um, uh, I'm not sure that is the right way to go. So in so kind of summing up and coming to an end, as it were, um, if Boris or you know the government came to you and said, Matt, how do we do this? What would you say? <laughs> well, I'd say let's re-examine all our regulation to see that to, to, to find out whether it's swift in its decision making, permissive in its intent, i.e., to encourage innovation, not discourage it. Um, and in particular, uh, we need to have something called the innovation principle, which Andy Meyer of the um, IEA has been championing, which says when we pass a piece of legislation, just as we adopt the precautionary principle and say if this thing is if if a technology is going to do harm in the future, we need to worry about that. So we need an innovation principle saying, will this piece of legislation harm innovation? Will it deter innovators from coming forward to solve some of the problems that we've got? And if it does, can we rethink this legislation? And I think if we if we passed all our legislation through that filter, we would be able to um, uh, greatly uh, improve uh, the, our rate of innovation. And the result would be uh, faster growth, more prosperity, and more money for uh, social and health services. Well, Matt, on that note, that's a really uh, optimistic, but sort of a, a, a note to end with some recommendations for government. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you out there who are, are watching this or listening to this um, uh, video cast or uh, podcast. Uh, for more information on everything from the history of economics and pandemics to classical liberalism to other ideas and much more, please visit our website, www.ia.org.uk. Check out our YouTube channel, IA London, listen to our podcast on Podbean, and subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin to stay updated on all our activity, especially all our online activity during lockdown. Thank you very much for joining us.